Hello everyone, Loremaster of Sotek here, and I'm back with part three of potential things we might see in the Wood Elf Lord pack coming up in the near future. So, if you haven't already, I would encourage going back and watching at least the first video, preferably the first two, that way you can kind of get an idea on what all is covered in this. Just a reminder though that these are just potential ideas, not full-on predictions, I'm just trying to like cover all bases. But as we have been doing, the first thing we're going to talk about is a potential new Legendary Lord. And the featured character for that today is going to be Araloth, the Lord of Talzin. So, for those unfamiliar, Araloth is essentially the only quote-unquote normal Wood Elf that is available as a special character to the Wood Elves during at least 8th edition. There are, of course, many, many heroes of the Wood Elves, like Scarlock the Hunter and tons of others, but Araloth was kind of the one that, for various reasons, showed up as the playable representative to stand alongside the likes of Durthu, Orion, the Sisters of Twilight, etc. So who is Araloth? Well, as we said, he's the Lord of Talzin, which is the place where the King's Glade is, as he is basically, I think the best way to describe him would basically be an elf who stands against the odds, no matter how dangerous or spooky they may be. He's essentially the walking embodiment of, like, the Eternal Guard. Like, he's their mindset, but dialed up to 11 and put into a single character. Now, I will say that he is a little on the bland side of things, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Erloth was always kind of a strange character because he doesn't have any magic items. Uh, he literally does not have a single one associated with him. He was a character that had a couple of special abilities that didn't really do a ton, and he was kind of meh. He had a very, very good stat line, but... There's a reason you never really saw him. So I think he would very much have to go through a considerate amount of changes. But let's talk about what he already did and then maybe what could be added to really make him stand out. So the first thing, like I said, is that this guy is stacked when it comes to a stat line. Um, Erloth does not carry a ranged weapon. He's purely a close combat fa fighter. He also doesn't ride any mounts. But when he's on foot, he is insanely skilled. Like, this is a character who would probably have the highest weapon skill, or sorry, the highest melee defense and melee attack in the entire army. Like, he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Orion and, like, hold his own when it comes to pure skill in a fight. You know, it's, it's famously noted in the end times that he actually managed to go up against Tyrion wielding the Sword of Cain. Not because he's really strong, but because he's so skilled, he was basically able to keep Tyrion from stabbing him. Because if you get stabbed by the Sword of Cain, you are, uh, you're in trouble. But in any event, so I would say that he's a character whose melee defense and melee attack should be some of the highest in the game. Like, he should be insanely skilled. But... To kind of, as a counter to that, that's kind of all he's really good at. He doesn't have a ranged weapon. He doesn't use magic. He doesn't have a mount. So, like, you're dealing with an infantry-only character who's going to need things that really allow him to survive and thrive despite that. He also was noted as being freakishly fast. Like, not only is he an elf, so he had, like, always strike first, but he also had one of the highest initiative stats in the game. And he had a ton of attacks, considering he's just a dude on foot. So, I would say um, the thing they could do to make him pretty spooky is that he should attack very, very quickly. Like, he should have one of the fastest set of attack animations. You know, kind of like spear thrust, spear thrust, spear thrust. Like, he should be attacking notably quicker than most other characters to really help him stand out and be good, especially when he gets into those dueling scenarios. As for his actual equipment... Uh, Basically, he just carries a shield and an Azrai spear, and then he has like a really badass looking helmet that isn't a magic item for some reason, but it's a really cool looking helmet. So, and we'll come back to that helmet. But essentially, he has very little armor. Like, Erloth is kind of your pinnacle of Wood Elf style. 
so he's practically naked um, when it comes to like actual armor but like i said he makes up for that in other ways and the biggest thing that he would need to have is he needs to have a passive not a active but a passive called the favor of the goddess and the favor of the goddess should just give Aeroloth like a flat high ward save like he should have a 25 percent to 40 or maybe 50 percent ward save that acts as keeping him alive um if you wanted i guess you could make it a passive that maybe is like 25 percent ward save and he get maybe he could like give it to allies within 20 meters or 25 meters or 30 meters you know something where actually you know what i think the coolest way to do it would be like maybe if he had a version that changed depending on if he was alone or not because he traditionally has a rule called boldest of the bold you know what let's do this one at a time so first of all he needs to have like a really powerful defensive ability i guess you could make it an active if you really wanted to drum it up but considering how vulnerable he would be to just a ton of different kinds of damage i really feel like it should be a permanent passive you know maybe he could just have like a flat 25 percent ward save and then the favor of the goddess could be an active that adds on to that uh, so he wouldn't be cranking a 40% all the time, but he could have it like when it's really, really necessary. In any event, beyond that, uh, let's talk about Boldest of the Bold. So Boldest of the Bold was a rule that basically made it where Erloth was one of the most leadership heavy characters that has ever existed. Where if he's leadership 10, which is as high as it goes... But he's also stubborn, which means that he ignores all penalties to his leadership if he's in a unit. If Aeroloth were ever to be by himself in tabletop, Boldest of the Bold just flat out upgraded him to being unbreakable. So a way I could see this maybe working in Total War Warhammer if you wanted to keep the aesthetic, which granted, Total War Warhammer usually just tends to upgrade abilities to be like their best version rather than having any of the downsides they had in tabletop. But if you wanted to keep Aeroloth thematic... One thing you could do is maybe he has like a passive aura that if there is a friendly unit within like 40 meters of him or 30 meters of him, he gets like plus 10 leadership and he gives all of those units plus 10 leadership. But if Airlot does not have any non-routing allies within that distance, so like everyone within 30 meters of him is either an enemy or is like a shattered or routing ally then instead Aeroloth gets the unbreakable bonus so if he's like out by himself or he's the last man standing he becomes unbreakable that could be like a really fun and thematic way to do it or of course you could just have it be that he has a perma passive for boldest of the bold where he's just flat out unbreakable like He's just the Ungrim for the Wood Elves, which would be kind of interesting, you know, giving the Wood Elves like a nice unbreakable character running around stabbing people with a spear. Uh, of course, he would be very uh, heavy on, uh, you know, armor piercing anti-large damage because he has an Azrai spear, but he does have one more ability, and this is actually his most unique gimmick that I actually liked, which is that he actually has a little companion. He has a little hawk that's um, his friend named Skarn, Skarn, Skarn? The Eye Thief. And Skarn the Eye Thief is basically this nasty little hawk who flies around and waits for an opportunity when Aeroloth is fighting something to dive bomb in and tear out that person's eyes. You know, that's why he's called the Eye Thief. And it was it was a really cool ability, but the unfortunate part of it in tabletop was that the odds of getting it to work, like it would do it was okay at doing reliable damage. But you really wanted Skarn to steal somebody's eyes. But he only stole people's eyes on a 6, which was a bummer. Um, <laughs> you wanted it to be a little more reliable than that. However, if he did steal your eyes, he would basically nuke your weapon skill and initiative by 5. Which is huge. <laughs> like, that would knock almost anything in the game down to, like, weapon skill 1, initiative 1. Unless they were, like, insanely good characters. Um... So the way I would have Skarn the Eye Thief work is it should be an ability, an active ability that he has where he basically is able to choose a target uh, within, say, 100 meters. And you have a little animation where Skarn, like, you know, flies down, sw swaps somebody, 
And what I would have it do is maybe it could do like a like a nice little spike of damage, like a nice little amount of uh, DPS that is mitigated by armor. Um, but anybody that is targeted by Scar and the Eye Thief takes a penalty for like, I don't know, 30 to 40 seconds where their melee attack and melee defense are just like gone. Like their melee attack and melee defense should just be reduced by like 30 each or at least 30. Um to represent them basically being blinded for the duration of that ability. That would be really, really powerful. Um, you might need to curtail it so that it only works on characters instead of working on units, but in tabletop, he could technically, like, Skarn could basically just pick any enemy model, so he could use it on uh, units if he really, really wanted to, to, like, snipe out a unit champion or something. But I think for Total War Warhammer, it might be appropriate if it could only be target single entities. So maybe, like, it can only target monsters and characters. That would be fair and really interesting. I mean, I think with Scarin the Eye Thief, he could actually be a really good character in Tabletop. Uh, or sorry, in Total War, if he was able to, like, be able to target monsters especially. But, you know, characters as well. You know, if you get, like, a full surround on a dragon or a Hell Pit Abomination or a Grimgore or something... You hit them with Scar and the Eye Thief, and if they basically go blind for a hot minute, so they can't defend themselves with melee defense, and they're not hitting anybody with melee attack, you could really go all in to uh, just stab the shit out of them, take them out. I actually think that would be a really interesting and powerful ability, and since he's your legendary lord uh, for your army, you'd have to rely on like an interesting hero or powerful units to you know take advantage of the situation. Because you wouldn't be able to, like, throw Durthu or Orion at them, since Erloth is taking up that slot. As far as uh, what I think he would need, though, to really, like, stand out and be fun, I think, honestly, for Total War Warhammer, there are two things he could use. Uh, first is a mount. Honestly, Erloth being only on foot never made any sense. It seemed like they did it to kind of be like, oh, he's supposed to go in your Eternal Guard units, but then they gave him the rule where he's supposed to be, like, fighting by himself? Which was super weird. And there's no other character in the Wood Elf roster who is a cavalry character. Like there is the Sisters of Twilight who ride um, a Grey Eagle mount or a Forest Dragon. But there's no like cav lord beyond the generic characters. So I would actually say give Aeroloth either he can be on foot, he can ride an Elven Steed, or he can ride a Great Stag. I, I think that would be totally fine. As long as his price was adjusted appropriately, I don't think it would be that overpowered, and you could do some really fun and interesting things with him. But yeah, I would absolutely upgrade him to have the Elven Steed or Great Stag Mount options. Beyond that, when it comes to magic items, I would really like to see them do something with that. Because er So Erloth's story is basically that he was this really cowardly, just kind of garbage person... Um, he was like the worst lord among the Wood Elves. He, like, you know, whenever the Wood Elves would go out to hunt, Erloth was very noted as being a coward who would only hunt things that couldn't hunt him back. So he was just like, which is just sad, uh, especially for Wood Elves. And whenever something threatened the forest and, like, Talzin was called, you know, his province, Talzin, was called upon to fight, Erloth would basically, like, send out his armies but would never go with them he would just stay in his home and party because he didn't want to risk being killed and then one day when he was like out on this big hunt he got knocked off his horse and uh all of his by like something happened it doesn't really say but like some spooky event happened and he was uh knocked sprawling and all of his allies scattered to the winds and he was basically stranded with just his hawk and he ended up finding a glade, a very mysterious glade, where even though it was dawn, he walks into this glade and there's a crescent moon hanging under it, over it for some reason. And he sees a beautiful elf maiden being attacked by a Keeper of Secrets, one of the big four-armed greater demons of Slanesh. And he, like, completely, his desire to save her um, and not allow this monster to uh, have its way with her overwhelms his sense of fear. And he, like solos this greater demon he goes and fights it this epic fight um where he should have died but scar the eye thief sweeps in and manages to blind the greater demon so it can't see him and because of that he manages to kill it one-on-one -on -one. well two-on-one 
And it turns out that it was basically like a trial, and the elf main was Lilaith, who spends a lot of time with him. And Lilaith essentially... Lilaith in this story does not take him as a lover, she, which she does in the end times. In this storyline, she more takes him on as a champion, um, and she gives him three... She basically tells him that she's going to give... She's going to give the Wood Elves three gifts because that's all that's left of her power. And she's going to give them three gifts to help them in what's to come. The Rana Dandra, which is the final war against Chaos. The first gift that she gives them is Araloth, which is basically... Which is to mean that she basically... just She put him in that trial so that all of his fears and incompetence and... Um, anxieties would be destroyed by that. He was basically confronting his own um, terror. He was confronting his own inner demons when he fought that greater demon of Slanesh. Uh, because it, I don't think it was a real one. I think it was literally like that scene from the last, uh, the last of the original Star Wars movies where Luke like fights himself <laughs> in the cave, and it or Luke fights Darth Vader in the cave, and it turns out just to be his like fears. Uh, it was basically that moment, but. Uh, the second gift she says she's going to give the elves is Erloth's firstborn daughter, who apparently will be born at, like, an auspicious moment and will have something to do with changing, like, saving the fate of the elves at a horrible time. And then the third gift, she's like, I can't tell you what that is yet. And I, I'd have to reread all of the end times, but, like, clearly the author of the Wood Elf book, which I believe was Matt Ward, wanted these prophecies to be a really big deal and come true in the end times. And they kinda did, until a different author wrote book five and, like, totally abandoned that plot line. So I don't think we ever find out what the third gift is. But, essentially, what I would say is I would lean into that and be like, okay, may, let's have Erloth actually have some items that, like, represent his being Lilaith's, like, favored champion among the Wood Elves. So, like, maybe his helmet could be, like, the helm of the moon, or, like, the helm of the crescent moon, where it... Because his whole thing is that he's always looking around Athel Lorin's glades uh, whenever there's a crescent moon because he hopes to see Lilaith again. So you could have, like, that whole thing, and maybe it could provide some, like, various buffs or whatever... Or maybe his shield or his spear could be made magical or something special. I would just like to see him get at least a magic item to help him stand out a little bit. I don't understand how Games Workshop put out special characters without items. It's so silly. But, you know, whatever. In any event, so that's pretty much Aeroloth. Um, I do think he would have some pretty interesting potential to be a fun character. And he frequently traveled around the world um, to fight various evils. Uh, his most famous adventure, of course, being when he went to the Forest of Arden within Bretonia, where he battled uh, Morgur, the Corrupter, which was actually the second time he had fought Morgur. Um, Erloth fought Morgur twice. The first time he fought Morgur, um, the Wood Elves lost, and he barely got away, and Morgur escaped. Um, so, like, they lost Morgur, and the Wood Elves got totally massacred. And then the second time... Um, with Ariel, with Orion and Ariel's blessing, they gave him, like, a gourd of sap from the, um, Oak of Ages itself, and he went to the Forest of Arden, where he battled Morgur again. They had this big battle where, or, uh, at the end of it, uh, he basically takes this gourd of super pure magical amber essence sap stuff and, like, throws it in Morgur's face, like, just... Basically like taking a frying pan of oil and just launching it into your opponent's face. And it just burns Morgur to death. Like Morgur just immediately ignites uh, with purifying fire and has a really bad time <laughs> until er and Aeroloth kills him. And he ends up like using that. So maybe that could actually be his item is the Gourd of Sap from the uh, Oak of Ages. Because he also used it to purify the Forest of Arden. And it like healed and was no longer a forest of shadow and evil. It was like alive and wonderful and gave uh, life to wholesome animals again and like hunters and harvesters and woodsmen could go through there without just being constantly murdered <laughs> so um like that was a big deal and uh, i'd love to see that kind of be something that he focuses on anyway that pretty much wraps up Erloth. so uh, it'd be really great to see him at some point i'll i'll confess that i'm not he's not super high on my list right now uh, but i would like to see him eventually so moving on to the generic character that I would like to see, 
Um, the generic character we'll be focusing on today, I think, would be a new hero called the Shadow Dancer. So, Shadow Dancer, if you can't figure out from the name, is basically a Wood Elf War Dancer who is the closest thing that exists to being a priest of Loic. So, Loic is the trickster god of the elves. He's, um, he's a god that's all about illusions and dance and trickery. And he's one of the few of the Elven Pantheon that's, like, still around. Um, because he's able to constantly slip and, uh, slide away from Slaanesh's clutches. And he even, like, occasionally steals souls from Slaanesh's plate. Much to the anger of the, um, Prince of Pleasure. But the closest thing he has to a priesthood are the Shadow Dancers. Because War Dancers are basically the embodiment of Loek. Um, with all of their crazy illusion dances, and they're all about telling stories, and uh, they're very mysterious and all this stuff. But the Shadow Dancers have perfected the art. And they've gotten so good at it, uh, the art of dance and manipulation and illusionment, that they basically, through their dances, are able to channel the Wind of Olgu, which is the Wind of Shadow. And they use it to like create illusions and mess with people's minds um, and trick the crap out of them in battle so that it makes them a lot easier to kill. And so the way I would have a Shadow Dancer work is basically it should be a hero choice. Um, as for what weapons it would wield, uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe to kind of help it stand out, he could have like, uh, he could maybe have like one long weapon. Not a spear, but maybe like a two-sided uh, blade thing or like a large great weapon type looking blade that he dances with just because... We already have, like, the double, the dual-hand weapons war dancers, and we have the Azrae Spear war dancers. But, then again, looking at the Wood Elf Heroes roster, if we don't get the Glade Captain, it would be nice to have an anti-large hero warrior among the Wood Elf roster. So, I guess give him an Azrae Spear. So, yeah, he could be a Spear Dancer. But, uh, he could have a Spear, should have extremely high melee attack, decent melee defense, I would say. Um, no armor, like very, very little to virtually no armor, but of course he should have the, uh, talismanic tattoos, which give him the physical resistance buff that the regular, um, war dancers have. On top of that, he would have the blessing of the ancients, so he regenerates magic, uh, for your side faster while he's standing in forest, and he has all of, like, the forest strider and forest star, or woodsman buffs and stuff. And then what I would really have unique with him is while he should have access to the lore of Shadow, so he's just a full-on Shadow caster, um, you could do, I would have him for the Shadow Dances of Loek. Right now, all of the Shadow Dances are basically split up across different units. So, like, one of the Shadow Dances, um, which is the... Uh, one of the Shadow Dances is, like, Storm of Blades. That belongs to one unit. While the, I think that's on like the regular war dancers. While the woven mist dance is on the spear dancers and the shadows coil dance is on the regiment of renown. I think that's right. What I would do with the shadow dancer is I would have him have access to all four dances. Because uh, there's four. And the fourth one we'll get into more in a minute. But um, I would basically have him, like if the dance is an active, I think he should have all of them. And if the dance is a passive, he should just have it. But I would really, really like to see him be the uh, hero where you'd be like, okay, I have the option of all these dances, which all have, like, really interesting abilities and stuff, where, like, the Storm of Blades increases my melee attack but lowers my melee defense. The uh, Woven Mist increases my missile resistance but lowers, I think it's melee defense again. And then the Shadow's Coil, you know, lowers my melee attack or weapon strength, but it gives me a ward save. You know, I would love to see him have all the dances. That way he's like a more micro-intensive hero, where you you do want to keep an eye on what dance he has active. And I would literally have it essentially be kind of like a toggle, but there's four options instead of just one or two, where um, when he has one dance active, the other three are not active. So you're basically having to... Uh, like whenever you're wanting him to switch his role, you need to click on him and like change his dance while he's in the midst of casting spells and stuff. And I would essentially just have him be like really good anti-large armor piercing. So he's just awesome at like murdering Cav and dealing a ton of damage to monsters. He could be super fast on foot, so he's just hauling ass. 
um, and able to uh, have really nice, uh, powerful attacks. Apologies about that. And uh, I think I think that would be a, a lot of interesting fun. But uh, yeah, I think that actually kind of that kind of does it on that end of things. So let's move on to the next unit I want to talk about, which we're just going to jump straight into the Blade Singers, which I think the Bla which the Blade Singers are the War Dancer unit champion in tabletop. And the reason we're going straight to them from the Shadow Dancer is because they have the fourth dance that I want to talk about. So the Blade Singers, I would have be the most elite of the War Dancer units. So you have your regular War Dancers, then you have your War Dancers with Athrai Spears, then you have the Regiment of Renown, which are the Tricksters of Loek, and then I would have the Blade Singers above them. And then above them would then be the Shadow Dancer. So you just have all these, you, you've got a whole dancing troop. you got a whole circus going on in your army roster. But for the Blade Singers, um, basically what I would have the Blade Singers be is um, I would have them once again focus, and I've kind of dropped one of these in every video, but I would have these guys be an anti-infantry armor-piercing unit. So they should be a unit that's all about like super crazy AP as they're just like stabbing you in your weak points with their incredibly delicate dances that allow them to do sniper spots. So like they're stabbing you through your eye holes or the weak points, the weak joints in your armor and they're just masters at landing those killing blows. I would have them wield either two swords or like one big sword, probably two swords, um, have in like a really interesting dance, but they're active because Creative Assembly seems very dedicated to making it where uh, every War Dancer unit basically only has one dance. Um, for them, I would give them Whirling Death, which Whirling Death is the one dance that is not represented in Total War Warhammer right now. So for the Blade Singers, they should have Whirling Death, where I, I would have them have like really, really high weapon strength um, and melee attack and pretty like really solid melee defense, good movement and stuff. But when you activate Whirling Death, maybe Whirling Death would either lower their melee defense or it would lower their basic weapon strength. But in return, you get like massive AP and massive anti-infantry. Because if you chose the Whirling Death dance in tabletop, it literally gave you the armor piercing and killing blow rules. Which armor piercing, you know, very straightforward, translates to just AP damage. And Killing Blow, which in Total War Warhammer, Killing Blow is almost always interpreted as anti-infantry. Um, in the case of, like, Grave Guard and a bunch of other units that have it. So, I would love to see Blazingers just be all about that game of, like, they have pretty good damage. So And, like, maybe their attacks are really well designed for dealing with elite groups of infantry. Um, but you get them into, like... You get them into like Iron Breakers or Grave Guard or Chosen, and that's when you would slap that Whirling Death Dance where they just go ham on just cleaving through armor like it's butter. Like, I think that would be a really, really good mechanic for Wood Elf players. And I think as long as it was on like a suitably expensive unit, these guys being the most expensive of the War Dancer troops, um, it would remain like reasonably balanced. Like, they'd be a good unit to have. But you would still need to protect them because they would be very vulnerable to missile fire. Uh, they have virtually no armor, so you don't want them getting caught up fighting like goblins or dwarf warriors or longbeards uh, with great weapons or something because they could like genuinely be in danger. Um, but yeah, so hopefully uh, people would find that interesting. And of course, like regular uh, war dancers, they should be like immune to psychology and they have the talismanic tattoo, so they have a little bit of physical resistance um, and all that jazz. And then the last unit I'm going to talk about um, as a potential option to kind of go along with Aeroloth are the Eternal Wardens. So what I would do with the Eternal Wardens, which are the big, they're like the big bosses of the Eternal Guard. Um, I think what we could do with the Eternal Wardens as a really, really interesting unit option is I would have them be a unit that like a generic unit that you could have multiples of that provide the guardian ability because basically eternal wardens are like the most they're the most experienced and common bodyguards and but because they're like a unit you could have multiples of and in, maybe instead of giving them like the regular guardian they could have a slightly worse version of it or i guess i mean i guess if they were just a very expensive 
elite unit that could take Guardian. I mean, there's no point in having multiples of them. Like, you wouldn't want to have multiple Guardian units, I would think. Especially if it was an expensive elite infantry unit. Even if it was a generic unit. Like, Guardian doesn't stack. So, like, you're like, oh, okay, I brought Durthu. I've got a unit of Eternal Wardens to make his physical resistance, you know, a bit higher. But what you wouldn't take multiples. I, I think that would be stupid. So, yeah, I think they could get away with having Guardian. So, I would have them have the Guardian save. Especially since we got it taken off the Wild Rider Regiment of Renown. So, currently, to my knowledge, there's no Guardian unit in the uh, Wood Elf roster. So, the Eternal Wardens could have Guardian. Um, be a very elite, you know, shielded and speared unit. The A... Still not that great of armor because what else just don't do armor unless it's like tree kin or uh, tree men But you know very high melee defense. Oh, you know respectable melee attack uh, Rather swift compared to most elite uh, spear infantry But they would still have armor piercing anti-large because they wield Azrai spears And I would have their whole thing be that they have crazy high leadership crazy high melee defense um and that they specialize in protection. So they should have the Guardian ability. And then I would give them another ability. Which in the Wood Elf book. Uh, when you read the segment on uh, Eternal Guard. The Eternal Guard essentially have a formation that they use. Which is known as the Fortress of Bows. Bows as in like, like the bows of the trees above you. Like tree branches. So I would actually give that to them as an active or a passive. And what I think the Fortress of Bow should do is I could see it as like an active where if you activate it, the unit becomes like unable to move, like they become entrenched, but maybe they're, um, maybe they're like their armor piercing and charge defense goes up. So instead of just having charge defense against large, they upgrade to being charge defense against, or expert charge defense, so charge defense versus everything. So they get expert charge defense and they also get a larger anti-large bonus so they can just punish the hell out of any cav or monsters that they manage to catch. Maybe it shouldn't lock them in place. That might that might be too punishing considering a lot of those units specialize in like hit and run tactics. So maybe it should just be an active that you can activate and just for like 10 to 20 or maybe like 10 to 15 seconds it gives the it upgrades them to expert charge defense and have a larger anti-large bonus. That could be really really cool. And would reward players who could kind of micro and try and lure you into charging them with anything. Um, or could just be really good for, oh, okay, I'm going to catch, like, their monster. Or maybe Carl Franz has swooped down and try and gooned out one of my casters that's near them. So they're providing Guardian and then I can pop this buff and they're able to shank Carl Franz a bunch of times. I don't know. I think something like that would be really fun and interesting. Um, so, yeah, that's the Eternal Wardens. And that means there's only one piece of this video left, which is a proposed new mechanic. So to go along earlier with me talking about Araloth and the whole gourd of sap from the Oak of Ages that he uses to uh, restore the Forest of Arden, I think a really interesting new mechanic we could see would be literally restoring forests across the world. So, right now, in Total War Warhammer, there are essentially three, no, four magical forests on the world that are definitely connected to the Oak of Ages. Which are uh, the Gaian Vale, which is in Ulthuan, that's where Alariel starts. Laurelorn Forest in the Empire. Atholoran, And then Orion's Camp in the bottom of the Southlands. So, what I would really like to see is for there to basically be a system of these forests are ruined or they're like struggling with like in, in corruption or people attacking them or they have like big problems and the wood elf campaign be about like going to these places to help them out um either because you like you travel there and you're like trying to confederate with them or maybe, like, you find a forest that's just completely ruined or it's owned by, like, an evil faction. Like, granted, I have ulterior motives for this. But I would love to see, like, way up in the Northeastern Empire. Like, you know where the Brass Keep is? That set of mountains? I would love for north of those, a little bit northeast of those mountains, to put, like, a new forest province. That's the Forest of Shadows. 
and you could have vampires there, which would add more vampire counts to the map and make it so that Manfred and Vlad have some other people to talk to and hang out with and confederate, potentially. And also, we could put Zacharias the Ever-Living there, just saying, at some point. But, um, like, that one could start owned by vampire counts. And maybe you could have um, the forest that the Wood Elves teleport to in Nagaroth, which I think is called, like, the Deadwood. Uh, maybe that could be there and it's owned, it's like just ruined, like it's totally empty. Or it's owned by Skaven, since we think that Skaven are going to be the enemies in this big DLC. And maybe, like you could have forests around the world where, like if you go look at yesterday's video, we have that map of like the world routes. So maybe you just look for different places where the living world routes connect, or even some of the dead world routes. And you just put a place there. And the Wood Elf, the new mechanic could be about, like, going to those places and restoring them. And that could be the focus of the campaign instead of this stupid garbage with the Amber that everybody hates and nobody wants to do. Like, don't get me wrong. I don't want them to get rid of Amber. I want Amber to still be part of the game. <laughs> but it needs to have its importance greatly reduced and made so that if I don't have Amber, I don't want to kill myself. Um... So, uh, I think that would be really, really fun. Just adding more of those forests to the world and, like, you go there and your job is to, like, restore them. Um, either, either that's, like, the point of the campaign or maybe there's, like, significant rewards. You know, obviously, if they put unique structures there, I think unique structures are the best thing in the universe and they're the best way to incentivize players to conquer exotic territory. Um, I wish CA added more of them. So, that would be really nice. Or maybe there could, I don't know, maybe if they wanted to, like, have the Wood Elves and they were like, oh, hey, we know Wood Elf players don't really have a lot of Regiments of Renown, so maybe they could give us more Regiments of Renown, or there could be, like, campaign-exclusive Regiments of Renown that you get by restoring these forests. So, oh, okay, you've, like, fully uh, taken over the Forest of Larlorn, and you've helped them with their problems, and gotten rid of all their corruption, and... Um, like, you, you've made nice with them, they give you, like, a Regiment of Renown Wood Elf unit. Or you go down to the Forest of Shadows, and you defeat the vampires, and you kill them all, and wipe them out, and you take back the Forest of Shadows, and get it all healthy. Well, okay, for that, you get a Regiment of Renown Dryad unit, or a Regiment of Renown Tree Man. Um, and then maybe you go to the, um... Gay and Vale in Ulthuan, and you take that over from the High Elves, and you restore it to its full glory and stuff. And for that, you get like a regiment of renown, another regiment of renown tree spirit. At Orion's camp in the Southlands, you could get a regiment of renown, like other Wood Elf unit, you know, just stuff like that. But in any event, um, hopefully, those are some really interesting ideas. I would love to know what y'all think of those proposed, uh, of either the proposed idea of Erloth as a legendary lord. The Shadow Dancer as a proposed character, the Blade Singers and Eternal Wardens as proposed units, and the restoring of the World's Forests as a proposed mechanic. Be sure to let me know what you think of those down in the comment section below. I'm really, I'm really, really eager to always see comments from you guys, whether you love or hate an idea, and why. Like, why do you like something that I mentioned, or why do you think it wouldn't work? Is there something I haven't mentioned so far in the last three videos, including today's? that you think, uh, they're like, oh man, he's got to talk about this. Um, of course, we do have one more video to go, which will hopefully come out um, the day after this one does, uh, assuming nothing weird happens. So, and that'll be the last of the Wood Elf speculation videos, and we'll just wait until more news comes out, which hopefully, uh, I, I would be surprised, honestly, if we hear anything else in August. Uh, maybe at GamesCon, which I think is like the last few days of, like the last week of August, I could see us maybe getting a trailer, or maybe at least getting some news. Um, but I don't know. We'll have to see. In any event, um, I do also want to give a quick shout out and thank you to all of my patrons. I really, really appreciate y'all's uh, generous support. Uh, especially when things have gotten slow or been a little boring. Um, and I hope you guys are enjoying what we're working on right now. Which they know what I'm talking about. Um, that will close up pretty soon. As we'll be advancing on to the next stage. And I also wanted to give a very big shout out and thank you to the uh, the big lads, the uh, the guys who uh, really uh, I don't know how they do it, but they uh, managed to be very very active, generous supporters, being Sign of the Emperor, Charles Bode, 
Jeffrey Reimers, Wendell Short Eyes, Eric, and Higgins the Seagull. In any event, thank you guys all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care, stay safe.